the careful play of words in the book. But not so much the play of words do I draw your attention to, but to capture a man who is able to identify what is critical as a success factor in every business that he has gone into. Many operators had gone bust through overzealous bidding for additional spectrum. So MTN knew that to avoid a bidding frenzy, and he also knew they would need to avoid a bidding frenzy, among their competitors, they would have to make an exclusive offer with a purchase price so substantial it would be difficult to refuse. And this is exactly what they did. The unfolding of this offer and the ensuing negotiation happened against the backdrop of MTN suffering one of the world's largest recorded regulatory imposed fines, 5.2 billion US dollars. This was later negotiated to a significantly lower amount. Now, as a result, the entire MTN team changed midway through the sale process, necessitating our getting an entirely different group within MTN on the board with the acquisition, whilst they were distracted grappling with how to meet the 5.2 billion fine. Ladies and gentlemen, it is received wisdom that I abridge even further what I'd been requested to read. The intrigue wasn't over. To complicate matters, the Abu Dhabi-based sovereign wealth fund-backed operator called Mubadala, which owned the Nigerian telco com company called Etisalat, had learned of our impending deal. Recognizing the asset gold mine that Visaphone owned, Etisalat sued MTN Nigeria and Visaphone as a second defendant as well as a regulator, the NCC, for approving the deal. Etisalat's claim was that MTN was already too big, dominated the market, and that the government should not allow MTN to become bigger by acquiring Visaphone. The lawsuit was filed at the Federal High Court in Lagos. The court's ruling was short and simple and straightforward. Etisalat lost. Despite all these huddles, I'm proud to say that the deal closed and every one of the two million Visa phone subscribers enjoyed a seamless migration to the MTN network. It is appropriate that I pause at this moment and I invite you to look at, for those who have it, the front cover of the book. You would see the civic towers looking like a candle lit. And I know from the holy book, there's a charge there that no one lights a candle and keeps it under a bushel, but puts it on a stand so that it would shine amongst men and all will see. Mr. Jim Ovier, you have lit many candles and you have put this. Even the capture of the title of the book, Africa, Rise and Shine to many people. It is not just that Mr. Ovier has shared his good works, his success stories with people, but it is that it has a bigger impact beyond what was read or taken in the chapter or will be taken in the chapter excellence and empowerment in creating a model unique school to empower others it is as i take from the what our good friend and elder brother professor patu tommy always says a quotation from reverend father keller a catholic priest who says a candle loses nothing by lighting another. Mr. Ovia, may you continue to light more candles in people's lives. Congratulations.
Thank you very much, sir. I will take one more reader, and he will be my final reader. I may take one goodwill message afterwards, but this will be my final reader. Ladies and gentlemen, he has served as the managing partner in the law firm Olani Wuwajai. He's a senior advocate of Nigeria with over 25 years of legal expertise. Please make welcome Professor Koinsola Ajayi, S-A-N. Please keep clapping until he gets here. Your Excellency, Mr. Vice President, through you, my salutations to everybody. Mine is a story of education and hope. And I will be reading chapter 23, so you hear the musings of this great man of hope. It's a story of abiding faith and the great grace of the Lord Almighty. This book is not about money, it's about determination and purpose. The book is not about wealth, it is about light that confounds darkness. This book is about a man who, the last speaker says, is a light unto the world. And these are his musings. James Hope College, Excellence and Empowerment. There is a story behind how the project came to be named James Hope College. The name James is mine, the one with which I was baptized. The name Hope came from an unexpected place. It was 2015. I was one of numerous people watching stunning news broadcast from Chile, where 33 coal miners have been trapped far below the surface for two months. Surface-to-surface -surface mine communication had just been established, and for the first time, the miners were able to communicate their situation and their wishes. Watching the broadcast, a hurrying rescue effort was beginning live on camera. A reporter said the wife of one of the trapped miners was due to give birth to a baby girl. Fearful of the possibility that the father might not make it out alive, a fiber optics line was provided to him. I remember being glued to the television with my wife as we watched CNN's minute-by-minute -minute live coverage of the tribe miners. One story in particular struck a chord with me. Ariel Ticona was able to pass a message to his wife, Elizabeth Segovia, following the birth of their daughter. Using a fiber optic video link set up between ground level and a small underground refuge where they could remain trapped for several months. Tell her to change the name of our daughter and give her a long distance kiss, he said. As other miners shouted, we're going to name her Esperanza. Esperanza, Spanish for hope. That single word expressed what those miners and their families and everyone following their plight were holding on to. Across the world, people focused on the miners and joined the massive expression of hope. It was a feeling that became even more poignant when every one of the miners was pulled to safety and reunited with their loved ones. I was moved very deeply by Ariel Ticona's act, sending his message out through several thousand feet of earth with his daughter's name, such a positive, uplifting expression in a long, dark night of crisis. The broadcast coincided with my thinking about what to name the new high school. The old primary school that had been demolished happened to be the very one in which I learned to speak